our welcome to camp and to welcome to food camp, the series of events that's running here the whole week uh, and is focused on how food can make our cities better and vice versa, which is a question that's been occupying my mind for a while. And uh, as it was happening, it was going in all directions because it's a very complex issue that you can look at from different angles, which is actually something that we are doing here this week. And uh, But sometimes it can get really going to too much in one direction, too much sustainability, too much design, too much city identity as such. And uh, it made me realize that what this event surely needs is an anchor, a good start. Uh, somebody who can talk about the basis, like why food matters to cities and to our lives. Uh, and I was wondering, is there such a person that can like take all these complex issues that I'm having around my head and give it to people in like a smart and easy to digest way? Uh, and uh, then I was lucky to stumble upon a TED talk that actually was doing exactly that. Uh, and employing powerful examples and uh, inspirational talk and also uh, British humor that I appreciate a lot. Uh, and it's a person that's been doing that since 2009, uh, elaborating on the idea up to a point of a second book that we're going to hear about uh, tonight as well. And uh, we're very lucky that not only such person exists, but uh, she's here with us this very evening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carolyn Steele. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, many thanks to Lucia for that lovely introduction, although I have actually been doing this for 20 years, since 2000, in fact. But um, uh, otherwise, that was very kind. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here at camp. And um, yes, I mean, indeed, the question of how you feed a city um, is one of those questions that when you ask it for the first time, you wonder why this wasn't a question that was always being asked in your childhood and in your education, especially for me as an architect. Um, for example, I remember as an architecture student um, going and seeing this amazing image in Siena. I don't know how many of you know it, do you? Anyone know this image? None of you know this image? Or are you just being very, very polite and shy? Okay. Um, well, it's an amazing, uh, as you can see, fantastic image. It actually sits on one wall of the uh, Sale dei Nove, which is the main uh, council chamber in Siena, painted, as you can see, in 1338. And, as you can also see, it's called The Allegory of the Effects of Good Government, um, painted by Ambrogio Lorenzetti. And I remember, as an architecture student, kind of, you know, wandering past this thing and kind of looking at it and thinking, well, that's a lovely image of the city, you know, how gorgeous. And I kind of probably looked at it for about 10 minutes and then wandered off somewhere else. And it is now completely amazing to me that what I didn't notice at the time is that this is all about food. How could I have missed that? Because we do miss food, because food is so obvious, it's so present in our worlds and in our lives and in our bodies, that we just don't see it. I often say it's too big to see. So now that I've got my weird food-shaped spectacles on, <laughs> um, I look at this image, what do I see? Well, I see, to begin with, a very weird uh, organization, you could say, because the, the image is split by this big red wall. Um, and it's a very unusual conceit to have a big split in the middle of a painting. But actually, when you look closely, you realize this is not actually a division. It's more like a membrane, because all of the action is going on through it. So, for example, we've got huntsmen leaving the city to maybe go and shoot a deer or something. You've got a pig walking to market. You've got uh, asses with grain on their backs. And in fact, you've got a long winding road going over here to a port. Um, you've got a very, very artificial landscape. And it's quite interesting. If you go to this amazing council chamber now, and look out of the window, you still see a landscape very much like this. You see vineyards, you see olive groves, you see a very highly productive landscape, and there's people working in it very diligently, of course. 
And then inside the city, there's more grain arriving on asses. There's a herd of sheep wandering about. There's a lady with a basket of eggs on her head. So what this image is really all about is the relationship between the city and the countryside and the fact that the symbiosis between these two things is in balance. And then you read the title again. It's the allegory of the effects of good government. And then it sinks in. OK, this is in the council chamber. What the painter is telling the councillors sitting there is, in effect, look after your countryside and it'll look after you. It's the most basic relationship in civilization, the one between the city and the country. So once that kind of sinks in, you then think, OK, well, why doesn't every council and chamber in the world have a painting like this on the wall? And that's a really interesting question. Today, part of the reason is that, of course, we don't live next door to the landscapes that feed us. I mean, this is um, London, where I'm from, you know, a huge metropolis of maybe 10 million people. Uh, where does our food come from? Well, ask any Londoner, they wouldn't have a clue. They would not be able to tell you. All they know is, oh, I just go to Tesco or I go to Lidl, and it's there like magic because that's how it feels when you live in a city, doesn't it? The food just arrives somehow as if by magic. But of course, there's nothing magic about it at all. In fact, it's coming often from landscapes like this. This is in Brazil, on the other side of the world. Often landscapes, as I now don't have to tell you because this stuff is getting much more visible now, that is, has been achieved at the expense of natural habitats like rainforest, or in this case, a sort of very rich savanna to be farmed in a very monocultural, very kind of efficient, I'm putting massive inverted commas around the word efficient, way to feed the city. But what we're really seeing here is a massive distancing, not only in terms of physical space, but also in terms of mental space between those of us who live in cities and the landscapes that feed us. And I call this the urban paradox. And the paradox is that, um, and here I like to use a term of Aristotle's, actually. Aristotle called us political animals, as probably most of you know. And I find it a very interesting term because it speaks about an inherent duality that we have as humans, which is that on the one hand, we're political, so we need company, we need society. Um, but on the other hand, we're animals, so we also need nature. So how do you create a habitat for a political animal? What does it actually look like? Well, clearly, if we're gathering together in cities, we can be as political as we like, and don't get me started on how political London is at the moment with the B-R-E-X-I-T disaster unfolding. Uh, um, but, but on the other hand, you know, are we really being good animals? Because are we really dwelling well in nature? Well, that's a moot point, but um, I think the answer is largely no. So the paradox is that the more we gather together in cities in order to be political or social, the further and further away we get from our sources of sustenance. Now, of course, for most of human history, we didn't live in cities. We lived in what you might call nature. I don't suppose it really looked very much like this, but nevertheless, I mean, I love this image, this sort of imagination, really, of what life before cities was like, Peter Rubens' vision of paradise. And I call this living in the larder. So that's basically what we used to do as hunter-gatherers. We lived in a naturally productive space. Um, we would pick fruit off trees. Obviously, faithfully, that particular apple kind of had nasty consequences. But we'd follow the food around. So we'd live in a certain place for a while until we'd exhausted its natural bounty, and then we'd move on and move around maybe sort of three or four years in a circle before we came back to where we originally were to, to give nature a chance to regenerate itself. So it was a peripatetic existence, basically following the food around. Um, and by all accounts, a very successful one, because it went on for many hundreds of thousands of years. Um, of course, at a certain point in this way of living, we made certain technological discoveries the most important of which was learning to control fire. So at this point, we start to get the beginnings of a slightly different relationship with nature because we're starting already to modify it. So we could use fire to burn areas of forest. 
to create clearings that would attract animals that we could then hunt more easily, for example. So we're starting to modify the landscape. And at the same time, we're starting to socialize in a totally new way. And I mean, I, I don't have time tonight to go into the utterly fascinating, um, but very lengthy and complicated story of how we evolved through fire. But the essence of it is that what fire allowed us to do is to live on the ground rather than in trees because it was a we could ward off animals using a fire as a defensive weapon. Uh, as I say, to kind of socialize and critically to cook food. Um, because what cooking food allowed us to do was to specialize in hunting. So before we had fire, uh, we were opportunistic hunters. We could only afford to try for a small animal um, once in a while, because if we failed to kill the animal, we would then starve. But with cooking, what could happen is certain people could stay home in camp, otherwise known as women, um, and others could go off and hunt, knowing that even if they didn't manage to kill the animal, they would come back at night and have a cooked meal. They could refill on calories quickly because cooked food is much easier to digest than uncooked food, and then they could hunt again the next day. So fire led to a revolution in our diet. We ate lots more meat. Meat is extremely good for your brain because it's a very high, high quality food in many ways, and our brains got bigger and we got smarter. Then we got better at sharing the food and dividing it up. And in fact, I mean, you could just talk endlessly about what we did around fires. We invented economy. You could say, you hunt, I cook, is the oldest social contract in existence. We invented politics. We invented a sort of a way of sharing. We're the only hunting animals that systematically share out what we've uh, acquired um, in, in with a sense of fairness, with a sense of kind of abstract fairness. So I often say, the shared meal is the oldest and the most finely tuned economy we've ever invented. And of course, the last thing to say about this is that it's technology. So we evolved through technology and with technology. Um, and of course, the next major step in this evolution was agriculture itself. Now, um, again, another enormously long history, but just briefly to say that um, if you think about what I've described so far, I've described a kind of peripatetic, a traveling existence. The fire actually made it possible to stay in one place for longer. So that was a, the beginnings of making home in one particular place. But the really profound change came with farming. And it comes, interestingly, at the end of the last major global climate crisis, known as the end of the Ice Age. So in this area of the Fertile Crescent, so-called, I mean, so-called obviously because it's uh, crescent-shaped and fertile. Um, it used to be very densely forested, and people lived there as hunter-gatherers. And, and that, in fact, is the real-life Garden of Eden. So that was the actual spot that was being mythologized uh, in the creation myths and so on. Then the forest started uh, to recede northwards as the earth warmed up, uh, and it became much sparser countryside, savanna. Um, but with the ancient antecedents of modern grains that we now eat, so emma, for example, was the old form of wheat, um, people were starting to survive more because the temperatures were going up and there was a, a food crisis, basically. And they started experimenting with a previously very sort of peripheral food, i.e. grain, and really saving the seeds and planting them in the ground and looking after them, basically, which people had never done before. So people had eaten grain before, but they kind of did it more or less on an ad hoc basis. Now it became very systematic. And if you think about feeding yourself that way, it's totally different because you're investing work in the ground. So you can't just wander off. Once you've planted a seed and saved it and watered it and protected it, you have to live there. So people began camping by the fields. And slowly we get uh, static human developments, de de developing like this lot up the eastern Mediterranean coast uh, from about 8,000 BC. Um, and they get more and more elaborate. Katalhuyuk is a actually very complex 
uh, interestingly complex uh, city. Uh, it's not quite a city, but, but a sort of semi-urban appearing uh, development. But the really critical ones were down here. These were the first farming settlements that are complex enough to be considered proper cities. And crucially, what they have, interestingly, is zoning. <laughs> so, you know, you have a kind of administrative district and a residential district and so on. And, and this is what architects, uh, ar archaeologists generally reckon means they deserve to be called cities. Um, this is uh, ancient Mesopotamia, Mesop Mesopotes, so between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, which brought lots of amazing uh, minerals and nutrition down from the Anatolian hills into these floodplains, which were very dangerous and they flooded a lot. Um, but, but basically, it was made the land extremely fertile. So really, this, what, I, what I just want to get across for this slide is the fact that agriculture and urbanity co-evolved. And you can't have agriculture. Well, you can have agriculture without cities, but you can't have cities without agriculture, because grain is the only food we've ever discovered capable of feeding large human populations. So it's the food of cities, basically. And there's many reasons for that as well. Um, here's one of those cities, Ur. So this is uh, roughly 2000 BC. Um, and you can see immediately several things about this. It's on a river. We already knew that. Surrounded by farmland. And actually, this is just I've just taken a, an aerial shot of the site as it currently is, by the way. So nothing much has changed in about 4,000 years. There's a very compact, dense city. So that's an example of the uh, uh, excavated uh, residential area. There's almost no open space at all. Um, but what you can see is that the city is dominated by this large temple complex. That's the fam famous ziggurat of Ur. Um, and that's where the gods lived. And this is the administrative complex that not only dealt with the spiritual life of the city, but also critically the harvest. It administered the harvest, the most important event of the year. So the, the temple organized when the grain was going to be brought in. It was taken to the temple. It was offered to the gods, stored in this large granary, the municipal granary, uh, baked in the temple kitchens, and then redistributed to the people during the course of the year. So, and writing was invented, and money was invented, and lots of things were invented to deal with this very complex new way of feeding people. But you know, if we were going to say, in modern terminology, you know, how did the earliest cities in the world feed themselves, we would say they were city-states. So this is basically a compact urban core surrounded by productive farmland. Um, and with very elaborate uh, earthworks. These were the first ever municipal earthworks that were built to contain the flood water and use it to irrigate the land and drain the land and so on. Um, all on slave labor, by the way, I should also mention, so I'm afraid slavery comes with this kind of way of living. Um, but fed internally by what we would now probably call a large centralized, spiritualized food distribution hub, which was the temple. And almost all ancient cities followed this model because it makes a lot of sense and it worked. Um, but famously, there was one city that didn't. So Rome was the first city to bust the mold <laughs> and really go the other way. So it had a million citizens by the first century AD. Uh, this is an amazing model of it a couple of centuries later in Eur. Uh, if any of you are heading out that way, I highly recommend going to see it. Um, but clearly, this is not a city that's feeding itself just from a few fields kind of outside the window. So how do you think it was feeding itself? I didn't tell you there were going to be quizzes, did I? I'm very patient. Yes? Yeah. I'll take the word empire. You've, you've, you've won, you've won, brilliant, exactly, empire. So Rome had an empire, and so it got its food in from what we would now call food miles, i.e., you know, thousands, hundreds, and, and even thousands of miles away. Um, I mean, we think of food miles as a modern term. It's really what I was just talking about when I was talking about all our food coming in from Brazil, but it's actually not a modern phenomenon. The reason Rome was able to do this is because it was on the water. It had command of the sea, and it was about 50 times cheaper 
easier, shall we say, cheaper, to transport food over water than over land. So if you imagine enough grain to make enough bread to feed a million people every day, that's a lot of grain. Grain is very heavy and bulky in relation to its value. Imagine all of that being grown around Rome and coming in on kind of ox carts and stuff. It's just never going to happen. So in fact, instead, Rome sequentially defeated Sardinia, Sicily, Carthage, and then Egypt. And these are very rich grain-producing regions. And it would basically export farmers and a military back up to these areas and then extract food in the form of taxes. And uh, Egypt was by far the most uh, productive of all. And in, in fact, uh, Augustus, who defeated Egypt famously, uh, Tacitus said that he, he won over the people with bread because he secured the, this most amazing, reliable source of bread. Um, and the grain port at Alexandra became the major hub. It's like the modern-day Rotterdam, really, I guess. And um, the grain ships coming in here were like the, the, the super tankers of, of those days. Um, and it's fascinating, in fact, if you look at the way Rome fed itself, because many of the issues that we face now already happened in Rome, uh, you know, 3,000 years ago. Um, I mean, one of the things, well, two and a half. Um, one, of, one of the things that we first notice is that uh, the extent of this, what we would now call a food shed, so a food shed is, an, is a name just basically for the hinterland that's actually being, you know, modified to grow food and to have the food extracted. Um, so at its height, Rome was uh, importing not just grain, but also oil, a wine, a pork, uh, a fermented fish sauce called liquamen that Romans were obsessed with, a bit like modern Vietnamese nam pla, um, even fresh oysters from, from Britain at a certain point. Um, and you quickly realize that no other city the size of Rome could have existed in the Mediterranean, which is why, in fact, it was so important to defeat Carthage, because it's, it's exploiting the nutrients from a, from a huge region. Um, and of course, the inevitable happened because they were extracting, but they weren't really replenishing the soils. And the soils gradually got more and more um, unfertile and salinated and eventually failed. Um, and I think it is fair to say that, uh, in the end, Rome basically um, ate itself to death, in essence. Its empire got too big. Um, and it had to keep expanding to find further lands, and then it just its internal structures couldn't cope anymore. Um, and I, 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 again, it's fascinating study because we've been here before. Um, the first person who really analysed the way the productive hinterland of a city would develop was a German called Johann von Thunen. Um, in 1826, he wrote a book called *The Isolated State*. And the isolated state's a fictional place. It's basically a featureless, flat, fertile terrain uh, with a city plonked in the middle, uh, represented by that pink blob. And he said, you know, how would the productive hinterland of the city naturally develop under these conditions? And he said, well, obviously, in the city fringes, you would have market gardening. You'd grow fruit and vegetables. Why? Well, we've identified two key constraints on the feeding of cities. The first is producing the food. And as we've already established, grain is the most important. Um, the second is transport. How do you actually physically get it into the city in an edible state? Now, fruit and vegetables, they're not an essential food. They were always a luxury. And B, they're very difficult to transport because they get squishy and they go off really easily. So both of those conditions meant that fruit and vegetables could be grown close to the city because it's a luxury food, so the farmers can afford the high land rents they have to pay. They can make very good use of so-called night soil, which is human and animal manure, which is very carefully stored and dumped on the land to make it more fertile. And last but not least, uh, they can basically get the, the fruit in an edible state because it's very close to the city. So fruit and veg in the fringes. Then about a 20 to 30 kilometer uh, radius of grain production and Basically, as I say, grain is a very important food in the ancient world, but ironically, it's very low in value to its bulk, so it's big and heavy. Um, and this means that beyond a certain point, it's uneconomic, literally, to bring it into the city. And so this effectively limits the size to which the city can grow. 
And then on the outer band, you have livestock production because, of course, the animals can walk into market, so they can actually be grown hundreds of miles away and then provide their own transport. And the only concession that Fontunen made to this model was to say if the city was on a river, then obviously those bands could expand a lot further because it's much cheaper to bring the food in over water than over land. Now, I remember being lectured on this in my first year in architecture school. In fact, it's the only time food ever came up in the entirety of my education and basically falling asleep with boredom. Um, he was a terrible lecturer anyway. But um, it's actually much more interesting if you apply it to real cities. So here are a couple of real cities. My hometown of London on the left, Paris on the right. Uh, these are the main ports, so that's the legal keys uh, where all of the, the uh, ships had to dock and unload. Same thing in Paris, this is the Porte de Grève, uh, which all the, the grain was uh, traded there, it was the main port of Paris. Um, apart from the fact that one's a bit later than the other and one's in colour, can you spot an obvious difference between these two images while I have another sip of water? I'm very patient. The reprises. Anyone shout something. I'm so shy. Is anyone thinking, I think I know what it is, but I'm not going to say. No. Shall I tell you? Lucia knows. OK. These are ocean-going ships. These are river barges. This makes all the difference because London was able to do what Rome could do. It could bring its food in from wherever. In fact, by the ninth century, it was already bringing most of its grain from the Baltic. Paris could not because Paris was effectively landlocked because the Seine is about 170 kilometers to the coast from Paris and it's a very slow, sluggish river. So it always struggled to feed itself which is why the French king was, had to take responsibility for feeding the people. Um, and when the harvest failed, which uh, basically it, it did regularly, he was blamed. And then in the 1780s, an Icelandic volcano went off and there were failed harvests for a decade and Paris starved and the king was blamed. And I think we know where that all ended up. Not good for the king. So basically, this explains several things. One is why uh, I actually often say this explains Brexit, but in fact, uh, nothing explains Brexit, so forget that. But um, it, all, it explains why politicians are terrified of food, because they can't really control it. And being responsible for feeding people is horrible for politicians. Um, but also explains why, you know, I mean, English kings and queens, they never bothered to feed their people. They never took responsibility for it uh, because the city just fed itself. So we developed very early on this kind of free market attitude to food. As I say, there's a lot in here that if it doesn't explain Brexit, because Brexit is like a hideous curse sort of visited upon the British people from, I don't know, Mordor. Um, nevertheless, because I'm really pro it, um, it, it, there is something in there about the way British people see themselves as kind of, you know, natural international traders, and the French are much more about, well, let's just stay here and control everything. It's quite interesting. Anyway, um, here is London. So it's happily feeding itself. It's, it's doing all the things Fontunen said it should be doing. It's surrounded by market gardens, as all um, pre-industrial cities were. The grain is mostly coming in by river. Um, it's trying to get up into the centre of town. Uh, Cheapside was the main uh, market. Corn Hill is where it was traded. Bread Street shows you that it's being already traded on its way up from the, the two main ports of Queenhive and Billingsgate as it's travelling up into the city. Fish is obviously also coming in by river. Uh, Billingsgate, some of you may know, remained on this site as London's main fish market until the, 18, uh, the, the 1980s. I mean, incredibly late when you think about it. Um, Fish Street, uh, again, tells you, tells you what was happening. Friday Street is where you went to buy fish on a Friday because the eating of meat was forbidden, which it was for many days of the year. Um, and of course, meat is not doing that. Meat is walking in, so cows uh, and sheep from as far off as Scotland, 
waddle, 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 they're coming all the way in. Uh, they're fattened in the city suburb because uh, basically they lost about up to half of their body weight having walked that far. Um, and then they come to Smithfield, which is a smooth field uh, outside the city, uh, which remains London's meat market today. And another thing to say about food is that when the foodways and the, and the markets are established, they very rarely move. Because if you think about it, food has to keep flowing all the time. You can't say, ooh, let's do it a bit differently. Let's have the grain coming in from here tomorrow, because you, it, you've got to eat all the time. So there's always great inertia when food ways are established. OK, so that's my hometown. And you can see how food is shaping the city. I've had a little look at your gaff um, here. And well, I mean, you know, some of the things are very, very obvious. It's on a river. This is where one wants to build a city. You can see lots of rafts uh, coming up here. So it will have been like Paris. It will have not been able to just, you know, do vast amounts of uh, international trade, but it was, of course, a great trading centre. But it's happening at a sort of a much more sedate scale, shall we say, on rafts. I'm imagining that there will have been a grain market somewhere on the coast, a bit like in, in Paris. Um, and then in the city itself, I mean, clearly, uh, it's not very accurately rendered, but there will have been a lot of uh, grain grown uh, locally and also fruit and vegetables for the city. Um, and the, the nearest I've got to doing an analysis, I, I don't think I'd even dignify it with the name analysis, but um, with Lucia's help, I, I found a few streets that have got um, foodie names. So we have um, Cozy um, up here. Uh, forgive my pronunciation, it's probably totally illegible. Mazna, uh, meat. Um, Ribna, fish, although we decided that actually that was a late addition, so we don't actually think that probably was the fish market. That's a bit of a mystery. The Old Town Square, of course, the main market in the centre will have traded in food as well as other commodities. Um, pastry, so Seletna, uh, along here. Uh, eggs, we have Vrtirska, down here. Uh, and vegetables, so we have Havelska, down here. Um, so kind of a main market area here, kind of animals up here. Uh, there was, in fact, a, a meat um, house, so slaughterhouse, but also storehouse on Masna. Um, and, you know, if you look at this rather magnificent sort of axonometric of the city centre, you can see um, in these streets like this, the sort of stalls. They never really show as many stalls as there probably were. <laughs> Uh, because, again, as I say, food has this weird invisibility thing, so people just assume it's there, so they don't bother to represent it. But we know um, there will have been eggs sold here, there will have been vegetables sold. It's coming in from the countryside, um, and it's being traded. And, and off here is, is, the, is Meat Street, so animals will have been walking through the city as well. So you just have this sense of the city being full of food, basically, and people inhabiting the same spaces as the food, um, and it's overseen by the town hall, you know, so basically they can make sure it's all sort of happening, you know, as it should. And it's visible, is the point. Um, this is a great image of Smithfield Market in London when it was still a livestock market uh, in the early 19th century. And there would be up to 10,000 animals in that space at any one time. So you can imagine that living in a city like this, it would have been very difficult not to know where your food came from because it was kind of mooing and bleating outside your window. Um, so there's a great kind of awareness, in a sense, of, of, what, of what food was and where it came from up to this point. Uh, and I call it necessary chaos, because it was definitely chaotic. Um, because once you have animals walking into the middle of the city, they obviously have to be killed in the city. Um, there's a great description, in fact, in Oliver Twist, Charles Dickens, of Oliver walking through Smithfield and just the kind of greasy carcasses and the stamping and the noise and the mud and the mooing and the bleating and the bowing. It's absolutely brilliant evocation of, uh, as I say, chaos, essentially. Um, now, all of that changed uh, with the invention of these things. And it really is one of those cliched things kind of overnight. Because up to the point I've been talking about, cities have been constrained by geography. They've been constrained in where they could build, how big they could grow, what shape they could be, and so on. They had to stay, um, apart from very few exceptions like Rome, 
they had to stay kind of small and perfectly formed. Now, for the first time, it's possible to transport food long distances very rapidly. Uh, and as you can see from the first commercial railway ever built, which is the Liverpool to Manchester in the UK, uh, farm animals are actually on, on the trucks. Um, so it's all changing here. Um, so three things really uh, transform at this point. The first thing is that cities, as I say, I call it goodbye geography, they're emancipated. Now they can grow anywhere, any size, any place effectively. The second thing is uh, that food becomes invisible. So instead of animals walking into the city and being slaughtered in front of you, they're now getting killed outside the city and they're coming in as dead meat. And in fact, this is exactly what happened to Smithfield in the 1850s. So food becomes invisible. It starts traveling down special logistic pathways. And last but not least, the politicians, who've always hated being in charge of food because you got your head chopped off if you got it wrong. All of a sudden, we don't have to worry about this anymore, thank goodness, because the food industry is going to take care of it. So there's three very, very important changes that we're still living with today. The first thing, here is London in 1840, so it's just when the railways are coming. It's barely grown since those maps I was just showing you from about 300 years earlier. That's, that's pretty much the extent of the medieval city. When the railways come, it just splatters. You know, so very, very rapidly it becomes the kind of place that you couldn't possibly just serve from one or two markets where everyone's kind of, you know, visible and seeing what's going on. So urban sprawl. Secondly, kind of in the industrialization of the landscape on a scale never before seen. So this is the American Great West, enormous Great Plains around the Great Lakes and so on, west of the East Coast was, uh, you know, herds of about, they reckon, 60 million bison uh, on grassland. Then as soon as the railways come, the first thing people think of doing is standing on the roofs of the trains and mowing down the bison with machine guns, which they have a jolly good time doing. Um, they don't even use the meat or just the skins. They just pile the skulls up in great piles like this. Um, but crucially, what happens, of course, is that the landscape is released for... Oh, and by the way, Native Americans used to coexist with the bison, so they were invited to go and live somewhere else on a thing called the reservation. Um, and it opened up an enormous, very, very rich soil to monocultural grain production. And it's the first time globally there's ever been a massive grain glut, actually more grain than people could eat. So what do you do with grain if you can't eat it all? Exactly right. The clue was slightly in the picture, <laughs> exactly. It's the invention of cheap meat, basically. Um, so in Chicago, which is very um, well placed at the top of the, uh, strategically placed at the top of the Mississippi watershed and at the bottom of the Great Lakes, uh, they come up with this great idea of starting off the, the steers on the, on the land and then bringing them in to be fed up in these feedlots on grain. And of course, it's the beginning of industrial Meat production, meat's always been expensive and seasonal up to this point, and now suddenly it uh, it's, it's, it's appears to be cheap. Um, and of course, there are many consequences of this, uh, not least the fact that actually this, this brilliant idea of uh, replacing grassland with monocultural grain production turned out to be a really bad idea, because actually the bison were not only eating the grass, they were keeping it stable. They were nibbling it down, so they were sort of keeping it healthy. They were stamping the soil with their hooves, which kept it nicely compacted, and they were pooing on the land to keep it fertile. So it's a natural ecosystem that had been there for nobody knows, but I mean a very, very long time. When that's replaced with monocultural production and with plowing, then the soil very rapidly lost its moisture content, lost its humus, lost its living, uh, its living organisms that kept everything stable. And then horrifically in the 1930s, uh, after a series of very dry uh, years, um, there was the famous Dust Bowl and basically all the topsoil just blew off of several states and there was massive um, devastation effectively, ecological and human. And it's really the beginning of a debate that still rages today, um, which I unhelpfully polarized like this, but effectively, on the one hand, you have this idea of 
efficient food production being monocultural. Uh, Justus Liebig was the German chemist who first came up with the idea that plants had certain nutrients that were very key. Nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus, NPK, which is the classic triad that goes into artificial chemical uh, fertilizers. Um, and the fertilizers also relied on this uh, Harbour Bosch system. Who here has heard of the Harbour Bosch system? Yeah, no, no, and that's very normal. I mean, I, I, I must have asked, I don't know, 30, 40 audiences that question, and I think about three people in all those audiences have known. However, two out of five of us roughly wouldn't be here without this, because it's the uh, industrial way of artificially fixing atmospheric nitrogen. So most of the Earth's nitrogen is in the air, where plants can't get at it. And the only natural way of fixing it is certain plants, like legumes, have little nodules on their roots that allow them to turn it into a solid, like ammonia, that the plants can then take up. This replicates lightning strikes, which is the other way that atmospheric nitrogen is fixed. And it's fascinating because basically it's the, it's the total basis of industrial food production. Um, and as I say, it's reckoned by a leading expert on this that about 40% of the global population depend on now on this system. Um, but the problem, as Albert Howard, who is really the father of the organic movement, uh, realized, is that what it doesn't do is pay attention to the most important thing in the food system, which is the soil. And again, in another <laughs> sort of two or three hour lecture, uh, we could go into this in some detail, but it suffice it to say that what he discovered is that plants, um, they have mycorrhizal connections with the soil, which is basically via soil fungi, uh, which it, there's a whole transaction going on in here that's absolutely critical to the plant's nutrition and health. And it relies on complexity and it relies on living organisms in the soil which, needless to say, get totally killed off when you just chuck chemicals on it, because very often, once you've chucked a bit of fertilizer on, you chuck a bit of pesticide on too. Now, meanwhile, sort of back in the city, as it were, um, of course, cars come along. Uh, and actually, the war had a big impact on uh, leaning people towards the industrial rather than the organic model, because a lot of food had to produ be produced very rapidly. And not only that, but all the munitions factories that were making chemicals to produce bombs that were then converted to make fertilizers instead. And governments actually persuaded farmers to go over to the industrial model because they wanted to keep the factories in production if there was another war. Um, so we have a post-war scenario. We have cars replacing trains uh, as the main shapers of cities. The creation of these kind of post-war dream type you know, scapes. All of this, of course, is on prime farmland, because the other irony when you get suburban development is that basically the old city will have been deliberately put somewhere fertile because that's where you put cities so you can feed them. And then when they expand like this, it's over the best farmland. Um, and of course, you don't walk in a landscape like this. You drive a car. This is the first ever shopping center ever built um, in Minnesota by a, an Austrian architect called Victor Gruen who worked out that if you, I mean, Americans didn't like driving, uh, didn't like walking, he discovered, they liked driving. But if they drove to a box, inside which there was what he called eternal springtime, which is basically means it kind of had air conditioning, <laughs> um, they would walk 10 times further than they would in an ordinary town square. So basically, malls start to replace city centers. And of course, food is also denaturing all the time. So we've, you know, forgotten about what the food's actually doing, but it's starting to travel down these specialist logistical paths. And in order to withstand that, it's getting denatured. So it's being compressed and it's having powders added and it's being dehydrated and it's being repackaged in boxes that then sell themselves to you so you can get rid of the human in the whole interaction. Um, in fact, the inventor of the supermarket, uh, Clarence Saunders, his deliberate uh, idea was to get rid of the human in the transaction of buying and selling food. So she just popped out for a pint of milk and she's come back with all of this stuff because it sort of sold itself to her. Um, and she's going to basically stick it all in, you know, in the fridge and it's going to go off. 
So this is the beginning of our kind of modern distancing from food. And of course, supermarkets, they, they sit on the outside of cities because that's where it's easy to get the food to logistically. And instead of going to the middle of the city to a market to buy our food, we now leave the city and go to its periphery. Or indeed, we just don't do either of those things and we just dial up a curry on delivery and some slave delivers it in the middle of the night, um, you know, as if by magic, back to the as if by magic thing. So we now have a food system that's dominated not by, you know, a temple or by an emperor or a king, but by the market, and this is what it looks like. This is New York. This is uh, Manhattan, that's Central Park. Uh, and the red areas are food deserts. So food deserts are areas where you have to walk more than 200 meters without, uh, before you can find any source of fresh food. And that may not sound very far, but actually, you know, it turns out to be a critical distance. People won't really walk much further than that. And what it really means is that in these areas, there's almost no source of fresh food. And surprise, surprise, these are also poor areas and they're areas of high crime and so on. So basically what's happening is the food is following the money. Of course it is. Um, of course, cheap food, uh, and this is again an enormous subject. We spend less in nations like the UK, the US, and probably a little bit less so, but here as well, on our food than at any time in history. So about two generations ago, the average British person spent between 30 and 50% of their income on food. Now we spend 8%. So it's a tiny proportion. So we've created this illusion of cheap food, but it doesn't exist because what we do is we externalize the true cost. So about a third of farmland globally is degraded because of this kind of farming. About a 30% of climate change gases are associated with uh, food and farming. A lot of it to do with industrial production and livestock production in particular. And of course, we all know about the Amazon right now and Joao Bolsonaro. About 70% of available fresh water is now used in farming, and a lot of that is from non-renewable sources, so we're actually running out of water. About 2 billion people in the world are obese, but they're also undernourished, uh, you know, they're malnourished. This is a new phenomenon in history that you can be too fat and undernourished. And of course, about another billion or so live in hunger. This is eutrophication, so that's basically excess runoff of fertilizer from farmland, which is creating algae blooms in the water, and then that starves the lake of oxygen and the fish will die. About 50% of lakes globally are affected by this. Um, we're wasting up to 50% of our food. Um, in, the, in the US, it actually is 50%. We're feeding about a third of the grain harvest to animals, um, which if we ate it directly would feed 10 times as many of us. And there's all sorts, I'm sure, as you know, again, just recently it's become much more in the news about the methane issue with livestock and so on. Um, we're spending about 10 calories of energy for every calorie of food we consume, and we're on the brink of a sixth mass extinction. So we're seeing drastic drops in numbers of insects and birds in basically farmed landscapes, which is quite a lot of the world, probably an area the size of South America now is farmed by humans. And the world is turning into a hamburger, basically. Why is this? It's another long story, but in essence, it's because this industrial food model, which was evolved in the United States, is based on what I call lowest common denominator tastes. So, uh, again, <laughs> I'll try to make this short, because I'm probably going on too long, aren't I? How much longer have I got? Tends to happen. Just carry on. I'm sort of halfway, but I can speed up. <laughs> I'll speed up. Okay. Um, but in essence, a brilliant book uh, called Paradox of Plenty by Harvey Levenstein, describing how the uh, food culture in America evolved. Everybody arrived from different parts of the world. They found all their different cuisines a bit disgusting. They discovered that the only flavors that didn't disgust anyone was salt, sugar, and fat. So they took out the garlic and the paprika and the, you know, whatever else they might have otherwise had and just stuck salt, sugar, and fat in there. So you have this kind of diet that no one can resist. And in fact, our brains can't resist it because apparently you don't get salt, sugar, and fat together in the wild, ever. And there are three things that our bodies are programmed to want. So if we're presented with it, we just kind of go into <laughs> overdrive and we just can't stop eating. 
Um, and of course, there's a huge embedded power and money in it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so they're going to hell in a handcart. It's all going horribly wrong. What are we going to do about it? Now, the first piece of comfort that I have for you is that this is not a new question. In fact, from the very beginning of building cities, people have been worrying about it. So Plato and Aristotle both said that the city should remain small because otherwise it would get too big in order to feed itself. Um, and in fact, it's an idea that was copied by Thomas More in his Utopia of 1516. He was a kind of, I mean, his Utopia was a kind of critique of London and the fact that it was too greedy and too big and so on. And he uh, imagined this sort of uh, fantasy island consisting of semi-independent city-states on a kind of network. And everyone there was kind of food mad. Everybody farmed, people grew their own vegetables, they had vegetable competitions, etc. So it's a very kind of foodie vision. Um, and Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities model, I don't know if any of you have heard of this model or know it, some of you, yep, is Thomas More with railways, basically. So essentially, it's the idea that you keep cities down to a maximum uh, population of 32,000, uh, you have dedicated farmers, uh, and basically they, they kind of feed themselves, but there's also a network of railways, which means that you have enough density of population that you can have a decent symphony orchestra, because that was his kind of test of whether there's enough kind of civilization going on to make life worth living. So it's an attempt, if you like, to solve what I call the urban paradox, uh, to allow political animals to have one foot in the city and one foot in the countryside. That's what it's trying to do. He even got to build one, amazingly, although the fundamental idea, which was that the farmland would be owned by the city so that when land rents went up, uh, the farmers could stay on the land. None of that actually happened. Uh, so he just ended up kind of building a, a very nice sort of suburbia slightly outside London, and most people just went into London to work, so it just didn't really happen. Um, and of course, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of vertical farms, have you? Yes, there's quite a lot of nodding going on. Of course, these things didn't exist 10 years ago, but now there's lots of them. This was the first one actually ever built in Singapore, where they're a very, very rich country with no land. So that kind of explains why it works there. Um, aero farms in New York, uh, these in farms in Berlin in little sort of growy spaces in supermarkets, and this is our very own growing underground in London, which is in uh, disused uh, underground tunnels underneath Clapham in London. Um, so they're happening, they exist. But the trouble is, if you're going to try and feed a city like London out of vertical farms, you quite quickly rub up against the urban paradox again. So I reckon that you would need 2,000 buildings, 100 metres by 100 metres and 30 storeys high, and I don't know where those are going to go. And that's even if we stop eating animals and stop wasting food, which, and if we didn't do those things, well, you know, it just doubles. So there's a problem of scale, and this is the urban paradox. You can't feed a city from within itself, because otherwise it's not a city, it's something else. It's a kind of farm you're living in, just a very big one. Okay, so vertical farms, in a way, are the same as you know the garden city and, and so on. They're utopian ideas, which make a lot of sense on one level, but are not the silver bullet, as it were, because Essentially, they're a good idea, but they don't exist. So utopia is a do double derivation word. It can either mean a good place or no place. Um, and I remember finding this really depressing when I was researching utopia, because basically utopia is our best tradition of thinking in a multidisciplinary way about how we should live, and it can't exist, which is just, you don't want to think that like that. But it occurred to me that utopians go on a lot about food but they just don't kind of put food here. You know, it's just in the thinking. So I thought, well, what would happen if we did put it center stage? Because we live in a world shaped by food. You know, our bodies, our habits, our politics, our economics, our cities, our landscapes, our homes, our rhythms in the day are all shaped by food. Um, we live in Cytopia, from the Greek sitos for food and topos for place. But it, we live in a bad Cytopia because we don't value food. So the very thing that's shaping our world, we don't value. So what would happen if we did value it? Well, it's quite interesting. 
Um, food is basically a flow. It goes through our lives. It goes from some kind of productive landscape through a sort of whole distribution system. That's regional distribution center, RDC. Comes into the city, uh, into a market or supermarket. Comes into our kitchens. Or very often, it's already been cooked somewhere over here, so we're just heating it up. Uh, we eat it, very often not around a table anymore, in fact. Uh, and then it goes into the waste system, and on it merrily goes round and round and round. And of course, it goes through our bodies too. Um, but of course, it's much more complex than that because every stage of that journey is affected by every other stage. So for example, if that's your mum cooking for you and she's not a very good cook, or let's say your dad, just to be, you know, um, your dad and he's not very good, um, you can't win actually because that seems a bit sexist as well. Anyway, um, so you don't like his pea soup is made. So he says, well, I'm not going to bother with that again. Won't buy it from the market. Mark says, well, I'm not going to order it again from the farmer. And so it goes and so it goes. And you have habits, rituals. My granny did it this way. Preferences. Blah, blah. You know, two billion people in the world eat insects, for example. You know, you have these really major cultural uh, structures that overlay this flow. So really what we're dealing with is complexity. But the beautiful thing about food is that even though it's really, really complex, as complex as life, we understand it at another level because we all eat. <laughs> so we can sit by a pile of food and go, yeah, that's what I eat. You know, so this is the UK, which is sort of mini-me in terms of you know, having swallowed the industrial model pioneered in the US pretty much line for line. So we live out of packets uh, you know, and chocolate and kind of dog food, basically. Um, in Egypt, uh, it's totally different. These people don't have to be told to eat their seven a day, nine a day, or whatever it is, because that is actually what they eat. It's much fresher. It's come much more locally. It's more seasonal. But the family's a lot bigger. And she probably does nothing but cook, I should imagine. Um, and then we have Italy, which is maybe halfway through. A very, very healthy diet, inherently, but of course there's the sinister march of the soda pop bottles on the back shelves. So they're not safe either. But what you know from this kind of this food that we eat is that it will have an effect on it on the rest of the world. So for example, if we are going to eat meat, do we create landscapes like this? Do the cows actually eat grass, which is what they evolved to do? Or do we have CAFOs, which are concentrated animal feeding operations? That's 100,000 cows uh, stamping around in their own poo, being fed on grain, which we could be eating directly. They get sick because their stomachs aren't designed to eat grain, so they're pumped full of antibiotics to keep them from getting really sick, so we're running out of antibiotics. It's a just crazy, idiotic model. But 97% of uh, meat that is traded in the US is produced this way in about 95% uh, in the rest of the Western world, so most of it. Um, do we have social capital when we buy food? So do we go into the middle of the city, talk to a human, squeeze a grape, have a chat? Or do we leave the city in the name of efficiency and go to one of these boxes? Or do we just sit at home and let some kind of delivery mys mystical thing, magical carpet come to us in the middle of the night? Is food bringing us together? Do we have the knowledge to do it differently? Can we look at a bunch of vegetables and actually work out <laughs> what to do with them? I mean, I don't know whether any of you saw Jamie Oliver's, uh, Jamie Oliver's uh, f food school meals program in the UK, but he, he went to a sort of deprived area of school kids and kind of showed them a bunch of, you know, raw vegetables like leeks and stuff, and they were just kind of going, Ugh, what is that? They'd never seen fresh vegetables before. T absolutely terrifying. So do we have these people who are critical to the whole system? Because if you don't have people who can cook, you can't have markets. And if you don't have markets, you can't have local food systems. And so it goes. So Britain leads the way in the consumption of ready meals. So we, we fell off the cliff a long time ago. It's because we industrialized a long time ago. Food comes from the countryside. We moved our peasants off the countryside you know, roughly 250 years ago. So we lost the plot early. So we love this stuff. So that's um, him. He's pushing a button. 600 pounds of pasta are going into a huge vat. So, I mean, and look how happy it's making him. So that's basically how uh, a lot of us eat in the UK. Do we get around a table and chat anymore? This is a dying phenomenon in the United States where all of this culture is coming from. So only 43% of American families regularly eat around a table anymore. 
And look how happy they all are. Look how happy the dog is. <laughs> but, um, you know, do we value food? And, and by the way, I mean, there's so many studies. If you go back to that picture of the Hadza at, around the fire, this is how we civilize. This is how we learn to communicate, to share, to listen. And it's fundamental to us. So when I tell you that 90% of meals in America are now eaten in a car, does that sort of just stir a little bit of fear and wonder and horror in you? I really hope it does, because it's kind of weird. I mean, it really makes you question where we're going in society. What's so important that we can't eat, can't afford to make time to eat anymore? And of course, because we don't value food, we waste it. So this is... Uh, during the Second World War in the UK, every street had a pig bin at the end. You start your waste into it, fed, got fed to pigs, closing the loop. Now, that beautiful cornucopia of fruit and veggies out of a supermarket dumpster, because basically once it's got to its sold by, nobody will touch it, even though it's perfectly edible. So the question really, I've taken a long while to get here, but the question is, which of these, shall we say, solutions to feeding ourselves actually feed into what you might call a good life. You know, and there are a set of choices in a sense. You know, do we value the landscape, the animals that we may or may not choose to eat? Do we value social interaction, which food has always been at the core of, conversation, sharing, and so on? I know this has taken before the days of the iPhone. I do realize that. Um, or are we kind of going down this road, which, by the way, is the road we are going down. It's all about valuing food. So it's quite ironic that the greatest instances that we have of times and places when people have really valued food have been when, surprise, surprise, there isn't enough. So we have London in the Second World War. This is people actually digging up Kensington Palace and growing veggies on it. We have Havana after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, an amazing organic urban farming renaissance took place. We have Detroit after the motor cars left. Uh, people immediately started growing and sharing food uh, because they had to, because, th because all the major supermarket chains in the United States left the city because food follows money, doesn't follow people in the industrial food model. And it's not just about, you know, valuing nature or valuing, you know, the society. It's actually about doing stuff. I mean... As I'm sure you know, we're facing a kind of an era when more and more of our jobs are going to be done by robots. What are we going to do all day? Uh, and the answer is that food is a very obvious uh, area where if we value it, then there's a lot of joy to be had in working in food. So that's what British cheese looked like in the 1970s. It was yellow and came in kind of breeze block sized lumps and didn't really taste of anything. And I remember this very, very well. Now we have more than 650 artisanal cheeses in the UK. And this is because in a tiny section of society, people have decided they're prepared to pay more for food again. Now, of course, the argument then is, well, yeah, but not everyone can afford to pay for food. So if food gets more expensive, what about the poor people? My argument is we have to turn this logic on its head. It's not that because we have poor people, we have to have horrible food that's destroying the planet. We actually need to say, we need a society in which everyone can live well. And if there's people who can't afford to live well, then we need new economics. It's the other way up. We have to address the thing that happened when the political leaders sort of wiped their collective brows and gave the food industry free reign. This is what the food industry now looks like. This is from a study done by Jan Vellum Grievink, actually quite a long time ago now, but it was of six European countries in which he worked out there were 3 million farmers, 160 million consumers, and just 110 supermarket buyers negotiating that relationship. So this is called a monopoly, essentially. Uh, and it looks a bit like this, like that's the red squiggly lines is me. But if you understand, as I have come to understand, that food systems and society match each other, they map onto each other directly, then if we want to live in a democracy, we can't have a food system that looks like this, because it's just deeply undemocratic. How do you democratize a food system? Well, you can begin by joining the, the roots to the branches. And in fact, that is precisely what the food movement does. So Carlo Petrini, the co-founder of Slow Food, some of you have heard of him, uh, he comes up with this idea, he calls it co-producing, 
And co-producing means not just sort of lying supine on your sofa with your phone kind of going, ooh, shall I have Indian or Chinese tonight? Boom. And then having a kind of slave on a magic carpet coming along. But actually meeting the farmers halfway. This is a, a community-supported agriculture farm, the biggest one in the US. And what happens is people in Chicago pay him in advance to grow their food for the year. And then so he, they take the risk off him. And then they go and help him on the farm if they want. The kids come and they kind of get to experience the whole country thing. This is a, a, a food co-op in Brooklyn set up in the 1970s by a couple of hippies who didn't like the way the food system was going. There's now 40,000 members. They basically do four hours work a month in what looks like a supermarket. Um, but all of the food comes from regional farmers with whom they have long-term fair uh, agreements. Uh, obviously, you know, organic box schemes, I'm sure you have them also in Prague, um, directly buying from the farmer. Uh, and this kind of a village in Yorkshire uh, where they just got into major guerrilla gardening and it's now become a kind of tourist attraction. I know that's not necessarily always a good thing, but anyway, just the citizens started growing their own food. So it's the idea of actively getting engaged in feeding yourself. And of course, this can scale up too. So it's about making space in the city for food again, because it's disappeared. So we can grow food in the city. And it's very, very important, by the way, that we do this. So I must make the distinction between saying that vertical farming can never feed all of the city and saying that it's very important we do have food growing in the city because it re-engages us with what food is and where it comes from. So this is the first and still largest in the US soil-based rooftop farm, Ben Flanner, very cheery guy, very happy, um, in Brooklyn, and he serves local markets and restaurants. Embedding food in city governance, so the Toronto Food Policy Council was uh, set up about 25 years ago, the first one in the West, where all the city's decisions are fed through it, so food is embedded in their thinking. Farmers markets, obviously making space for that's obvious. Infrastructure may be less obvious. If you're going to grow, artisanal meat as part of a mixed farming system, and that's something we can talk about because it's complicated but interesting. You need local abattoirs, and this is a really big deal. Um, food hubs like this one in Canterbury, which combines a farmer's market with sort of produce from the local region that's on sale and so on all through the year. And the idea of patchwork farming, so even though you can't feed the whole city from within itself, just the idea that you do occupy spaces like this wherever you can, and it's part of a bigger picture. I often say um, that the ideal habitat for a political animal, as I've said, is one foot in the city and one in the countryside. And there's many, many ways we can do this, and it can be done at any scale. So it could be a regional planning design, or it could be me having herbs on my window outside my kitchen, because Everywhere you're maximizing the urban-rural interface, you, you have that ideal connection that we all need. So these are just various models of people doing it. Patrick Geddes, really the father of regional planning, talked about preserving ribbons of countryside so that the city would evolve in a sort of star shape. So you have a very, very long interface between the city and the country. This is actually a permacultural idea, the idea that all the interesting stuff happens on the edge between two different zones. These are two English architects, Byrne and Viljean. Well, actually, neither of them are English, but they're based in London. Um, talking about post-fitting the city with productive landscape. They call it sepals, continuous productive urban landscapes. And it's joining up spaces like car parks and verges and so on to create a long ribbon that actually goes out into the countryside. So it creates really the same effect as the Gadders model. Uh, this is a scheme in New York, just looking at the latent productivity of, of New York's hinterland and saying, OK, what could we grow here if we really kind of zhuzhed it up and made the connections happen again? And this very interesting scheme just east of Amsterdam by the architects MVRDV in Il Almera Osterwald, uh, where they're incorporating farming into the master plan. So they basically say you can have a plot of land and you can build a house on it, but you also have to have a farm. And it's really, really popular. And people are going a bit kind of anarchic, but, but it's, very, it's very successful. So bringing food into the, our planning thinking. And last but not least, of course, the jury is no longer out. 
the industrial organic question that we began asking ourselves maybe 70, 80 years ago, we now know that we cannot go on farming with chemicals because we're going to kill the planet. So we've got to go to organic. And this is really, really interesting stuff. And we can talk about it maybe more in the discussion bit. Otherwise, I'll just go on for another 20 minutes. Um, but permaculture invented by wonderful Australians, uh, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, uh, in the 70s now is just this idea of living in a way that is basically according to nature's laws, in effect. Um, a forest garden is an example of that. So instead of growing grain to the horizon, you mimic a forest, which is nature's way of farming. And this is something Albert Howard talked about at great length. And they're very, very productive, but we'd have to eat slightly differently, but that's fine. Uh, working with the soil, no-brainer. And also uh, chefs like Dan Barber, the third plate, he's really saying, instead of what we normally do, saying, oh, I fancy steak and chips for dinner, where can I get it? You look at the land and you say, what can the land produce? And I will eat that. So it's turning again the logic of chefing on its head. And really, this is, I guess, where we began as humans. We began through the sharing of food. We became civilized and human. We evolved language. And it still is our most reliable source of pleasure. And it still is how we really bond together. So I guess I'm making a plea for a good Sitopia. It's a world in which we value food. And that changes everything. It's actually deeply revolutionary. If you embed the true cost of food in food, everything changes. And we go back to kind of what I would call low-hanging fruit ways of divining pleasure. Because as Epicurus said, uh, you'll never get better pleasure than in satisfying hunger among friends. And that's the great thing about it too. We can solve a lot of the problems that we're facing by reincorporating uh, the greatest natural pleasure. And the one thing we have to consume every day so it's, it's a way to a sort of happy, steady-state economy, if you like. And really, it's not about food. It's about using food as a lens to see the world and understanding that food is too big to see. But if we do see it, it's this phenomenally powerful, collaborative, shared, practical way of getting, if not to utopia, then surprisingly close. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, that's my old book, and that's my new one. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, okay. for the very depressive at times, but <laughs> inspirational, <Sorry. laughs> I think, talk <laughs> in the end. And uh, so th are there any questions? Uh, if there's something that you would like to address more in detail or... Hello, good evening. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, when exactly did you start uh, being interested in this? And what's your back background when it comes to food? Or like, uh, because you, you said that you're an architect. So I would like to see the connection and yeah. how, you, how you got to do this. Gosh, that's another sort of 20 minute job. Um, thank you for the question. You know, I mean, where it really came from originally, I, I don't know. My grandparents had a hotel. And for me, if I do that kind of, I lie on a couch and wonder where it came from, maybe it came from that, because what a hotel allows you to do as a small child is, I call it sort of the, the, the privilege of going through the green baize door. So the green baize door, they actually were covered in green baize or felt. And behind it was all the service areas and the kitchen and the steam and the smoke and the shouting and the cursing and soup on the floor and blah. And then you went through this door and it was just like, ah, you know, antique furniture, carpets, everyone talking in hushed voices. And I thought, you know, this is so fascinating because I'm, I like to have a magic power that I can, as a child, I could go through this door. And I used to hang around by the door. It was just like a magic thing, you know, now you're in this world, now you're in that world. So 
the nearest I can get to sort of psychoanalyzing myself about both where the architecture thing and the food thing came from is maybe there. But later in my life, I mean, I always wanted to be an architect from the age of eight. So this is kind of weird because there's nothing like it in my family at all. And I became one and I studied at Cambridge in the UK. And I would say in my first year, I was already thinking, oh, I didn't think this is quite what architecture was going to be like. Because architects talk about buildings kind of incessantly. And, you know, you have kind of s the elevation of a Greek temple and you have to learn what all the little bits of the, you know, superstructure about. And I just thought I just couldn't give a monkeys about this. Um, but I knew I was interested in buildings. So then this horrible 20 year long agonizing period of my life began because I thought, well, I am interested in buildings, but not just the building. It's something else. And through a very long, as I say, painful process that I won't bore you with, uh, I realized that it was kind of really our relationship with buildings that I was interested in. And again, to spare you a long discussion, um, when I began teaching architecture, I would always put food in my projects because I discovered if I did that, my students would be very easily able to imagine themselves inhabiting their projects much more easily than they could if I didn't have food. So I just used food intuitively. Um, and then I did a study in Rome where I studied an area of the city over 2,000 years, just looking at how people live their everyday lives. And I instinctively chose the market area because I knew there would be lots of kind of ordinary life going on. And it became clear to me that everyday life was what interested me. And in fact, I called that study the mundane order of the city. And I became very interested, sorry, I told you 20 minutes. I became very interested in the word mundane. I don't know whether it's the same in Czech, but in English, we use the word mundane to mean boring, everyday. A mundane task, oh, she's doing the washing, you know, mundane. But the root of mundane is mundus, which is the Roman word for worldly, cosmic, of the universe. And this was a massive insight for me, because I thought, and you know I kept saying in my talk, food's too big to see, we don't, we don't value it, we don't see it, we do the, because it's so huge, it's so fundamental, that it, we just, it's behind our head, you know. So that was a step in the way as well. And um, the last stage was I was teaching at the London School of Economics in the city's program there. I was its first studio director. And this was my dream because I had politicians and economists and housing people and, you know, really amazing people talking about the city. And I learned a huge amount. But everyone was still, I realized, in their silo. You know, they were still talking down their disciplinary track. And I became nearly desperate by this point. And it was actually in conversation with a colleague from there. Uh, I said to him, should we write a book on cities together? And it was during that conversation that I had the idea of describing a city through food. And it was the biggest light bulb moment of my life. You know, it's literally like an explosion of ideas up above my head. My arms just had chicken skin. <laughs> you know, it's just like, this is my thing. And that was the day. I mean, literally the day. It was the 19th of April 2000 was when I started working on Hungry City. And, and, and food, therefore, was. It's so multidisciplinary. It transcends everything. So you can use it as a metaphor for life that's so close to life that you may as well call it life. But unlike life, which is just, you know, what's life? Food is just a plate of soup in front of you. So it has this brilliant combination of deeply complex, deeply mysterious, but also deeply understandable and practical. So that was kind of, <laughs> I hope that answers your question. <laughs> mm. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for a brilliant uh, lecture. Um, I'd be interested in your opinion about... Where, yeah, oh, just, hi, uh, hi. Right. I'd be interested in your opinion about the negative externalities. Do you think if we start paying for them that it would, uh, it could help to fix this, the food system? Yeah, I think we have to do that. Here's the problem. Uh, politicians, as I was explaining, hate having anything to do with food. A, it's very difficult to control. B, they don't want to admit that they don't control it, because in fact they don't. And I mean, there's an amazing book uh, about the feeding of Paris in the pre-revolutionary era called uh, Provisioning Paris by Stephen Kaplan, which I highly recommend. It's longer than The Lord of the Rings, but it's absolutely super interesting. 
And it explains how impossible it was to control the food system. And this was the problem. The king was expected to just be, you know, be able to magic bread out of thin air, and he couldn't. So people hate being told what to eat and how to eat because nothing is more personal to us and closer to our sense of identity than, than our food. So politicians are terrified of food, which is why they were so happy to kind of march off into the distance when the food industries first you know, came on the scene. But of course, now the food industries are way more powerful than any politician. They're huge. They're the biggest global multinational corporations, you know, apart from the energy ones, which of course is a similar problem. So yes, I absolutely think that we have to start internalizing the true cost of food because, if, for example, um, I mean, particularly industrial livestock production has to stop. I mean, it, this is just so destructive. We can't afford it. Um, but, but we're predisposed to want to eat meat. And uh, so there's all of these complicated issues about, okay, I mean, as you, I'm sure you know, I didn't talk about it particularly tonight, but, you know, Silicon Valley is getting heavily into fake meat. Uh, and th there's two kinds. There's the plant-based meat, you know, that looks like meat. Uh, and then there's meat grown in a lab, which is a bit more controversial because it's actually grown in bovine fetal serum. So it's kind of it's all a bit mm, Frankenstein. Um, but of course, that doesn't get you over the whole corporate ownership of the thing. And also, there's a big question about whether the sort of the plant-based meat substitutes are really that good for you because they contain lots of things like GM modified soy and coconut oil that all have their own separate uh, ecological downsides that aren't really haven't really been factored in properly. So it's super super complicated, um, and we really need to do it. And and I was thinking to myself actually yesterday. Um, what would I, as a consumer, really, really love to exist? And what I would love to exist would be some place you could go, like a website, where every food that's available is kind of, you know, analysed according to its ecological destructiveness and so on and so on. And probably there's something like a traffic light system, you know, like the government in the UK has red, yellow, and green for really bad for you, not too bad for you, and fine. And of course, we all eat the red stuff. Um, but like that, for, for basically ethical and ecological footprint. And of course, we've got very small um, you know, initiatives like fair trade, uh, which I guess you have here as well, where people have tried to, to sort of undercut the kind of the market logic of big food by basically saying we're going to pay farmers the right amount for the food but they're really struggling because they're not the mainstream so i think we we as a as a society just as we have to wake up to climate change we also have to wake up to cheap food not existing you know and that that is something that has to we need political leadership to get there of course, it can come from the people, and it already is in little pockets. But yes, we absolutely need governments to stop sort of bankrolling destructive behavior. Now, I mean, of course, now we have, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Jair Bolsonaro in, in Brazil. Basically, he's given the green light to uh, logging and, and uh, deforestation for cattle ranching in the Amazon, which is a total disaster. It's an international disaster. And... I think just as the UN and, you know, the, the kind of, I mean, we, we're currently having the sort of the, you know, climate change meeting in Madrid, we need a, a global forum on food, actually. And I think that would be a really important, necessary step um, to recognize that if we're going to, I mean, as a species, make it to the end of this century, frankly, we have to eat differently, but it has to be done globally. Um, and I, I, there's many, many aspects of this that I've gone into in some extraordinary <laughs> detail in my new book, working out how this might happen. But part of it is relocalizing and re-seasonalizing the way we eat. So basically going back to eating what the land around us can grow. Because we all evolved in places where the land can support us. We wouldn't be here, you know. So it's not like there's one diet that fits all. And, you know, whether we, how much meat we eat, we need to eat a lot less. But there are certain places in the world where it makes a lot of sense to eat meat because the landscape supports it very well. Like the UK, actually, we have amazing grass in the UK, which is why we've always been famous for beef, for example. So 
It's nuanced, it's systemic, it's really important. And we have to kind of shame politicians into, into uh, stopping pretending it's not their problem. And it's very interesting that it's only during wartime that we politicians have stepped up historically and told populations what they can eat. And I think we need to get there again. We need to behave as if we're in the crisis that we are in. Sorry, is that being terribly depressing again? I mean, but no, I mean, the answer, the short answer to your question is yes. <laughs> yes. Mm. Very much so. Mm. Had a question. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Uh, just a quick question. How do you see the industry change to feed 9 million people in a couple of years? Mm. So this is a really interesting question because um, the big ag lobby, if you like, they argue that the only way we can feed the world, feed the world, horrible term, I, I just think it's ludicrous, actually, but anyway, we know what we mean. Um, it's ludicrous, by the way, because it's, it's as if one group is feeding another group, and that's actually how it's formulated, uh, is that we have to go down, intensify the kind of the technical, industrial, blah, blah, blah. Now, I think that is uh, not only, for, for me, depressing, but also disastrous, because it implies many things. It implies that we, we move into cities, we're doing that already, but then we kind of pull up the drawbridge and we abandon nature in a sense uh, and we continue farming with chemicals and we continue, as it were, farming against nature. It's a kind of bullying nature into submission model. And by the way, I'm not a remotely anti-technology. There's amazing technologies around evolving that can help us farm with nature, but we have to farm with the soil for many reasons because that's the only way you can farm without chemicals. And if you think about plant health and human health, they're the same thing. So if you grow a plant on MPK, you know, it's like feeding it on salt, sugar, and fat. It's like feeding it fast food. And what's interesting is that the plant doesn't evolve proper root systems. It doesn't bother, because it doesn't have to. So it's really the same as feeding your kids on fast food, they grow, but they're kind of unhealthy. So we have to go down the organic road. Um, and what's exciting to me is that the latest research, I mean, again, it's a total fallacy that farming uh, industrially is more productive than farming organically or in other forms of system. It, it isn't. It depends what you measure. So for example, you may have heard that there's only 50 harvests left, left on some areas of land that have been industrially produced because the soil is just dying, it's just losing its nutritional value. Um, so if you're only measuring how many bushels of wheat I can grow on this kind of patch of land using chemicals, then yes, that's gonna be higher than the organic equivalent. Not that much higher, interestingly. But what you're not measuring is the soil health, and what you're not measuring is the downside of using the chemicals, which is killing all the insects, which is killing all the birds, which is gonna kill all of us eventually anyway. And then you're not measuring it against uh, a, something like the forest garden. Um, you know, this, which is incredibly productive because it's mimicking a rainforest, which is basically nature's most productive form. But you eat totally differently here. You know, you don't eat bread every day. You eat nuts, you eat berries, you eat different fruits. You know, you, you, you go back, interestingly, more to the kind of diet that we used to have as hunter-gatherers Nobody's proved, I mean, well, okay, so sorry, uh, I've read a lot of research on this. If we halved the amount of meat and dairy we consume globally, and if we halved the amount of food waste, both of which are very doable if we decide we're gonna do it, because of course a lot of the food we waste in the West is wasted because we don't value food. A lot of the food that's wasted in the global South is wasted because they actually don't have the infrastructures to keep it fresh, so it's a different problem they totally do value food, then we could feed the world 80% organically using no more farmland than we're using now. And I think that's a super interesting statistic. And the other thing is, if we invested money in organic farming and yields, we could close the gap within 10 years. So this idea that 
you know, we, we have a nitrogen deficiency, which is correct at the moment, we could actually, we could solve. So, and by the way, I'm not against certain forms of genetic engineering either, because there are some, for example, you know, like uh, they're working at the moment on uh, drought resistant crops or even crops that could be grown perelli perennially um, rather than uh, annually, which means you don't plow anymore, for example. Uh, plants that can absorb nitrogen, interestingly, although I'm a bit worried about that because that starts to mess with incredibly complex systems that have been evolving for billions of years. But, but the short answer is we can feed the world organically if we live and eat differently, if we have more farmers and if we pay more for food. But my argument is that we, we are paying for food anyway. We're just not paying it directly. We're paying it indirectly and we're trashing the planet in the process. And, second, and it's not just my argument, by the way. There was a study done in the UK that reckoned that we pay for food literally twice. So if you pay 50p for a loaf of bread in a supermarket, society is paying another 50p for all the ecological damage that's being done. Um, and the second thing is, if we pay more for food, then more people can work in food at a high level. So uh, that's why I show my cheese example. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people who are passionate about feeding people well and working with the land and, and making beautiful artisanal cheeses and breads and beers and whatever it is that feed people. And it can exist when we value food. So I think it's a win-win to sort of start doing this. But I, I just want to say, do not believe the people who say, oh, you know, it's all very well, but we all have to go back to being peasants. That's just simply not true. And there's a lot of very, very interesting cutting edge, edge technology that is helping us farm with nature. So for example, allowing us to analyze soil and work out exactly you know, what it's doing and whether it, where, which bits of a field need watering or which bits need a bit of a boost of nutrients and so on. So it's a much more complex picture, but we have to go to organic. That has to be the aim. Did that? Good, excellent, thank you. Are there questions from the audience? Ooh, they're, they're multiplying. That's good. <laughs> I think I have a really simple question. Are you actually hopeful we can pull it off? Yeah, I mean, do you know, it's so interesting. I, I've been writing this book for seven years. That one. Oh, no, yeah, anyway, the one on the right. Um, I don't think I was very hopeful when I started because... You know, the more you read about this stuff, the more terrifying it is. And I have to say, humans in power aren't behaving very well globally at the moment. There seems to be a total resurgence of, I'd now use a really rude word, but I won't because I'm in public, but shall we say unpleasant people in power. We have Trump, we have Bolsonaro, we have ugh, Boris. Anyway, um, and that's just, you know, the, the kind of, that's just scratching the surface. Um, and so I wasn't particularly ho hopeful, but I was trying to say that uh, through food, uh, there's a kind of way that you can get bypass all of that stuff because we all have to eat. So food has this incredible power that we don't recognize at the moment. What happened towards the end of writing the book, interestingly, is Greta Thunberg started kind of, you know, sitting with her placard outside the Swedish parliament we have people like Extinction Rebellion and so on. And actually, for the first time, really, in thinking about this kind of stuff for 20 years, I felt like, OK, politicians can't ignore this stuff anymore. This is really, really amazing because we have to deal with this. And if we have to deal with climate change and if we have to imagine how to move to a zero state economy, which we do, then food has to be a massive part of that. So I think forces a gathering that's going to make it impossible for politicians to ignore food for much longer. And that really excites me because all the models are there. And what's really interesting is that, you know, I often say that, I mean, because people sometimes accuse me of, oh, you're terribly, you know, romantic and historicist and blah. I mean, all of these models about the kind of the city state going back to the city state, why do they keep repeating through history? Because they make sense, because it's how you live in a, in a steady state economy is you, there's a brilliant uh, farmer in the UK, r farmer thinker, writer called Simon Fairley. He calls it the geography of muck. So that's literally a circular ecological system. So, and that's another reason why vertical farming for me is a bit of a distraction is because 
okay, I've got my tower block and I've got my lettuces in it. Where is the fertilizer coming from? It's, I'm importing chemicals from somewhere. So it's actually not a circular system. It's totally different from this old city-state model where they literally were recycling nutrients. Um, so I think that's an important thing to remember. If we're going to relocalize, and I think we do need to relocalize, and I don't mean all going back to living in little peasant huts. I just mean, you know, not importing beans from Kenya when we could be growing them on our doorstep. That just makes no sense. Um, of course, we have to have. You know, uh, we still want to get coffee from Kenya, though, because I don't think anyone's going to give up coffee anytime soon. You know, so there's. We have to unpick the kind of the weird logic of the way the food systems evolved, um, because because of the way we did economics back then. Because all the way through, we've been assuming nature comes for free. And it's very interesting. If you read Adam Smith, you know, the father of capitalism, he explicitly says this. He says, all wealth comes from nature, but nature is free. You know, that's, that's the way we've been thinking for, you know, nearly 300 years. Now we know, ah, all wealth comes from nature. And not only is it not free, but it's kind of sacred. It's so vital and so precious that it's beyond cost almost. You know, it's the other way up. And I think, I think it's becoming, I mean, you know, I've been working on this stuff for 20 years, as I said at the beginning. Literally, when I started lecturing on food in the architecture school in Cambridge, people kind of went to me, why are you lecturing on food in an architecture school? You know, what on earth has, would that have to do with architecture? And so that's really, really different 20 years ago to how it is now. So that gives me hope. And I also think that the beautiful thing about food is that it's, it is about pleasure. We're all wired up to love this stuff, you know. And I think if we just stop running around so much in pursuit of some weird capitalist idea of a good life, you know, and just kind of calmed down and started living in time again, we would discover all of these pleasures that we've forgotten you know, that are just there waiting to be rediscovered about actual communication, about working with our hands. I, I believe we're getting sick because we're not, we're not doing enough with our hands. We're not, we're not creating enough meaningful work for people to do. So we're, we're bored and we're frustrated, so we just consume and, you know, text. It, you know, so I, th I think there's huge potential in it. And whether it's going to be the, well, nothing's the answer, but I think it's, it's becoming more and more possible to argue this uh, as a serious political proposition, that food has to be at the core of a new vision of a good life that is more locally based. So yes, I am weirdly optimistic inside a sort of, shall we say, a, an outer shell of horror and f pessimism. <laughs> But but I, I I I choose to allow the optimism to burst through because I mean if you give up I mean game over anyway you have to keep hoping. So you say we shouldn't be afraid to read your book that's out in March next. No year. no no it's a very hopeful book. It's a very hopeful book and it ends on a chapter called Time. It begins with a Google burger so it begins with this weird thing of oh you know we're all going to eat more meat oh let's just grow it in a lab and I'm kind of going is this a good idea or not and, and I'm basically what I end up saying is it, it's a better idea than, indus than industrial livestock production but it's a really it's not a great idea <laughs> apart from that can't we just eat less meat please I mean you know how hard is that and then that gets into a whole uh, philosophical questioning about our relationship with technology and anyway or lots of stuff but the end chapter is called Time, and it comes back to this business of the mundane again, that living in time, so taking time for things like food and meals and sharing and preparing and cooking, it brings us back into, into cosmic time. And we need that to be happy. Seasonality, you know, and just dwelling in a space again and, and space has a fourth dimension called time, you know, so it becomes quite, as I say, sort of uh, like this thing is there that we can rediscover that I really, I believe I have rediscovered through food. I mean, I, food dominates my life just because I just get such infinite pleasure out of everything to do with it, not just talking about it, as you can probably tell, especially if I stand sideways. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I think it's, uh, I think we've been asleep as humans, and I think we've been pursuing this weird dream 
uh, that, that promises a good life but doesn't deliver it, called, shall we say, advanced capitalism. And it, uh, it's not without its benefits. And I'm, again, not saying we have to go back to, you know, I, we need capitalism, but we need a much more heavily modified version of it. And I think food can be the core of that, rethinking the economy. Hopeful. I am hopeful. It sounds a lot like method for mindfulness, actually. No, like yeah, being yeah. Well, present and I just that's really interesting. Sorry, totally. Um, Epicurus, who again I, I normally would talk about more, um, or sometimes I talk about more. He's in the new book. He he's all about being in the here and now. Precisely this. What's really interesting is that two of his teachers had been to India where all of the early kind of Vedic religions were already nascent. So it's like a Western Buddhism, actually. It really is that. And out of it comes Stoicism, which is weirdly, it's always sort of presented as the diametric opposite. It's not. Stoicism and Epicureanism are extremely close to each other, and they're all about embracing the necessary and embracing the real and living as if every day was your last. So it's incredibly Buddhist. It's really interesting. And that is what I base a lot of my, what I call, Setopian kind of philosophy on, is the idea that food brings you into the here and now. And you know it also connects you to the world, and it connects you to one another. So it, 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 see it, and be in the space of it, and then you're kind of, you're, you're placed in the world again. And we need to feel in the world. We need to feel orientated and at home. And, and food does that. I feel like meditating, <laughs> that's just where to start. <laughs> uh, is there any other question? Good evening. Hello. I usually don't have questions, but tonight I have to ask, do you think or do you see that in the future, like the access to good and high quality food is even a human right? Like at least in the West and then all around the world? Yeah, I mean, I think actually in a, it, it is a human right. And and I think that's a brilliant question to ask. I think we need a new social contract. And in fact, my metaphor for a good society is one in which everybody eats well. Because if you think about what eating well means, it means I'm eating food that is nutritious, that is tasty, that is ecologically and ethically produced. And that means, I mean, food is the biggest force shaping our world. And so eating well, if we all ate well, you can't eat well and have a bad life, actually, because if you're unhappy or if you're stressed or if you're threatened, you can't eat well. You know. it, it also saves the money the government if the people eat, Massively, e e yeah. eat well, then Massively. there is nothing like Massively. so many heart attacks and so That's on. totally correct. So, for example, at the moment, the big thing, I mean, uh, uh, sorry to bring up Brexit yet again, ah! but... Um, the NHS, which is our national you know, health sy uh, system, this was a big part of the propaganda of the Brexiteers. Oh, let's not pay all that money to Europe, let's put it in the NHS. Total lies, total bullshit. But, but the NHS is going to collapse because of type 2 diabetes, because we have an absolute epidemic of it in the UK, and they can't cope. So we have to change. And the trouble with the way we have all our political systems and all our economic systems, they're so short term. You know, if you could do a kind of, and, and many people have done this, a kind of, you know, cost benefit analysis, you know, whatever you want to call it, over the next 20 years, and they put huge investment in getting people eating well now, then the curve just, you know, what it looks like this, it goes like that. So absolutely. But but the trouble is politicians. They only care about being elected for the next three years, you know, and then they start campaigning again. They're, they're not long-term thinkers. So I think my dream is that we need new forms of governance and new forms of international cooperation looking at these things. I think we have just have to transcend the kind of short-termism of typical national politics. And it's also about the habit. When you are small and, you know, you yeah. learn how to eat well, and you eat well in your school totally. canteen, then your habits yeah. are getting better and better totally when you critical. are adults. So Absolutely that's right. part of that as well. Right? Absolutely right. Yeah, so again, my dream would be, I mean, I often say make schools kitchens, because you can learn anything in the kitchen. You can learn geography, you can learn maths, you can learn language, you can learn you know, everything. 
chemistry, biology, it's all there. So just make school kitchens, schools kitchens, and with a garden, a kitchen with a garden. This is this is this is my ideal. <laughs> this is my ideal habitat. But I think it's the ideal habitat of all humans, actually. And and a weird sick sickness is that we think that's all old fashioned or whatever, and you know it's much more kind of modern to not think about food, for example. So in other lectures, I often talk about Soylent, which is this kind of food substitute, if you heard of it, in the United States. You just you slug it down and you don't have to think about food. I mean, this is just fascinates me. It's such a weird thing to sort of say, oh, let's just hack food so I can do something more important, when food is just such a deep, deep source of pleasure if you, if you just chill a bit and let it be. So, yes, totally agree with you. Thank you for that. I think there's one question in the back, and it's going to be the last. Um, I reckon we have to agree with everything you said. It's quite obvious. My question is, uh, what's your idea to how to force politicians to solve it? Yeah. Um, vote left, because, sorry... Right-wingers never get this stuff. It's really, really interesting. I mean, if you look at all the great food projects in Europe in the last kind of 30 years, they're all, they're all socialist. They're all left-wing. Um, and as soon as the right-wingers come in, they just... Because they have this weird idea that freedom is to do what, as you like, you know. And if you want to eat, you know, drink yourself to death, fine, or whatever. So I think um, vote left. <laughs> um, Shame them in. I mean, we need, we do need a popular movement. With there's many, many food-related popular movements, but they're more to do with, shall we say, more focused on at, at the industry um, and various aspects of it. So Monsanto, for example, you know, there's plenty of protesters sort of going for them. Nobody's actually really gone for the politicians and gone. Hang on, this is your responsibility. So I think very much as greater the wonderful greater. Thunberg is shaming politicians into taking climate change seriously. We need, well, maybe write a letter to Greta and just get her to tack a food bit on the bottom of her speeches. You know, shame them into realizing that they have to deal with it because there will be a popular uprising otherwise. And it's really difficult. I mean, I do totally get that. It's really difficult because people do not like being told what to eat. But you can do things subtly. So you can make... Um, encouraging noises. There's a brilliant story I heard once at a, a kind of one of these ideas conferences. Um, someone was saying that in Russia, uh, in the 18th century, there, there was a real shortage of food, and and the Tsar was desperate to get people eating potatoes because they were huge, highly nutritious. But people thought potatoes were for cattle, so they wouldn't eat them. And this is another problem. So he, in the palace, he created the, the, the royal potato patch, which was only for royal people to eat. And then it was really badly guarded, you know. And then, of course, people began coming in in the night and stealing the potatoes because they wanted to eat like royalty ate. And so this kind of reverse logic actually sold potatoes to people. So I think there's really interesting, subtle things we can do in terms of changing the food landscape, as it were. Um, but, you know, really leading through desire and pleasure, I mean, is the way to go always. Um, and I think it's happening in tiny pockets. So, for example, in the UK, we have a really, really strong kind of vegan, vegetarian kind of movement, which is showing people how delicious vegetables can be, basically. Because <laughs> we come from a meat and two veg culture. You know, I mean, I when I was growing up, I you know, I mean, we didn't have meat every day, but I mean, it it was the idea of a proper meal was with a lump of meat in the middle, and now we have a whole cuisine coming with chefs like uh, you know Yotam Ottolenghi, for example. I don't know whether he's big over here, just doing uh, delicious stuff with vegetables, and people are sort of real. Oh, it doesn't have to be suffering to eat like this. So I think the government. The less scary side would be what this lady over here was saying, you know, really make food a big thing in education again. You know, give people access to growing spaces, give them access to cooking skills, and then you, you change things that way. And that's much easier than sort of going, 
Oh, you shouldn't be eating that much chocolate. Ooh. But we need that too. <laughs> a bit of that too. Um, so yeah, I think just we have to demand that our politicians deal with this. Just make them realise it's their responsibility. Let, let them get away with it. And stop Brexit. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's the final message. Stop mm. Brexit, please. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for all the questions, because that means that I didn't have to ask them. So it's great. Thank you, Caroline, for the wonderful presentation. Great pleasure. Thank uh, you. I hope that you had as much pleasure as I have <laughs> with it. Uh, and I'd like to invite you also for the rest of the program this week. If you want to know more about the city farms and urban gardening that was mentioned here, that's tomorrow when uh, we have a talk on London city farms and uh, Prague urban gardens with a uh, compatriot of Caroline coming, uh, Amber Alfred, who's going to be here to tomorrow night. Uh, then there is more of the pleasure side, actually. Uh, on Thursday, we have camping talk show with uh, local foodie Lokash Kalik and uh, architect uh, Andre Chybik, who built Manifesto Smíchov, for example. And they're going to talk on how uh, food can bring people to cities and how do you actually build a good food space. Uh, and then on Friday, we will actually continue in very much the same vein uh, of sustainability, how it can, how it looks bad in the States, but how there are actually people doing things right in the Chicago area. Uh, we're going to screen a movie called Sustainable, uh, a documentary on a very inspirational farmer from Illinois. And it will be followed by Q&A with uh, Jana Belikova and uh, Maška Pnica, Jolana Fischerová, on how we can behave sustainably ourselves here as, a, as people, as consumers, as people who go to restaurants, as people who want to have pleasure while eating food, but uh, not at the cost of our planet. So thank you for being here. See you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.